So um, hello and welcome to everyone joining us over Zoom and on Facebook Live. Uh, my name is Shubhanga Pandey. I am the chief editor at Himal South Asia, uh, the Colombo-based magazine of regional politics and culture. And uh, on behalf of the Himal team, I'm pleased to welcome you all. Uh, we've organized today's event to launch Himal's special series of articles on Bangladesh, which we put together to mark the country's 50th year of liberation. Um, it's a project our editorial team has been working on for the last several months, and the series is titled Rethinking Bangladesh. Um, and throughout these articles, our hope is to go beyond and when necessary challenge um, some of the conventional coverage that Bangladesh has received. Um, the discussion today will also be the fourth edition of South Asian Conversation. Uh, this is a series of online discussion we started in January this year, um, where we basically bring together people to talk about um, you know, issues of South Asian interest. And um, in the past editions, we've talked about the geopolitics of COVID-19 vaccination, um, borders in South Asia, um, women politicians in South Asia. So you can find the recordings and the transcripts of all these events on our website, himalmag.com. Um, we have a fantastic panel of speakers today, and um, some of whom have also contributed to the series we're launching today. Uh, the panel will be moderated by Shaidul Alam the photojournalist, teacher, and activist based in Dhaka. Uh, in a career of over four decades, Shaidul has also founded important institutions for training and showcasing works by photographers, especially from the Global South, um, the notable ones being the Drick Picture Library, uh, Patshala South Asian Media Institute, and the Chobi Mela International Photography Festival. Just to give you an outline of the events, so, um, my colleague, Deputy Editor Raisa, will give a quick preview of the articles that make up the series. And uh, after that, Shahidul will take over and begin the discussions for today. So over to you, Raisa. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Raisa. So I'll just give everyone a really quick overview of uh, some of the articles that you can expect to see. We have over a dozen writers who've contributed uh, as part of this series. Um, we'd really like to thank them for their work. Um, we'd also like to thank our five featured um, artists and illustrators who uh, really brought their individual kind of perspectives and styles to the series. Um, so we'd specifically like to thank Olokiat, Nasheen Jahan Nasir, Ishrat Jahan Shaira, Risham Shahat Tirto, and Akila Virasinghe for their work. Um, in terms of the articles themselves, they cover a broad number of themes. Um, in particular, we focused on perspectives on environment and ecology, the economy and technology to tell the story of contemporary Bangladesh. So um, some of the writers uh, that we're featuring in this series include uh, Naomi Hossein, who argues that coverage of Bangladesh, including um, of its creative economy and intellectual life, requires rethinking. We have an interview with Devjani Bhattacharya on empire and the shifting temporary landscapes and ecologies in the Bengal Delta. We have Anika Saba and Shamil Hussain on Dhaka's shrinking public spaces. Preeta Mahanti, who uses short film to examine Dhaka's shifting urbanity. And Kasia Paparoki on the need for deeper interrogation of climate change narratives in Bangladesh. We also have pieces on the politics around power and energy from Azmal Hussain and Joseph Alchin, a photo essay on border politics, specifically looking at the India-Bangladesh border by Parvez Ahmad Roni, a reflection on uh, crowd politics by Arif Sohel and Anupam Debashis Roy, and a short story from Shah Tazriya um, Ashrafi. Some of our writers are also here as panelists today so I will take this opportunity to introduce them. Uh, we have filmmaker, archivist, and founding editor of Rupan, Russell Ahmed, who collaborated with Efidul Haq on a digital oral history archive featuring queer ma Bangladeshi migrants. We also have Zara Rahman, who is a tech researcher, linguist, and deputy director at the Engine Room. Um, she's writing into us about digital Bangladesh, which while the details of this are quite big um, in terms of policy, is being used to repress and surveil citizens in practice, including refugees. And we also have anthropologist and clinical associate professor at New York University, Dina Siddiqui, 
who looks at experiments in global labor and safety regulations post Rana Plaza. We're also uh, glad to have Rosina Islam, an investigative journalist from Protomalo, who won this year's Free Press Award for Courageous Journalism, join us on the panel today. Thanks everyone for being here today and look forward to an interesting discussion. I'm now going to hand over to Shahidul to take forward uh, the moderation for this panel. Thank you for that. Uh, it's great to be part of this wonderful team uh, and I'm very happy that this has come together. I mean, Himal and I, well, Rick, uh, we go back a very long way. Uh, I remember when things were starting up and him, uh, Kanak contacted us to see how we could get this fledgling organization going. We started with the magazine, standard A4 type magazine, then the book form, now it's gone to web and there've been a lot of shifts. But I think it's important to remember that Himal is much more than a magazine. It is a network of people and ideas. And I was very lucky. I was with Kanak yesterday in Kathmandu, uh, and we were talking about how South Asia, if, if we count Afghanistan, Myanmar within it, is almost one-fourth the globe. When we were talking earlier on, I remember talking to Kunda when Panos South Asia was being started, and then we thought of South Asia being one-fifth of, of the globe. But we are extending our branches, if you like, and it is important that we extend those branches because uh, it has been divisive at times. There has been hegemony within the region. Uh, and I think it is important to uh, put things into perspective. And while there has been a lot of things about commemorative effect, uh, events at a time like this, there's been so much of history, I think what we would like to do through this is go beyond that. Uh, conversation of what is to come. And I think the people we have here are perfect for that. I, I'll begin with a few general questions and then break it up, maybe talk to specific people and go forward and back a little bit, if I may. Now, there has been this global coverage of Bangladesh. A lot is made of the GDP figures. Uh, but you individually, how does this compare with what you see? Your gut feelings and you know okay it's no longer the basket case that i think is uh, pretty obvious but has the inequality that bangladesh was going to achieve been achieved uh, what are the stories we're missing uh, I, I would like to get uh, an overview from each one of you short if i may because we'll keep it moving and conversational if i if we can so on my screen i'm seeing Zara, Russell, Dina, and Rosina. So I'll go in that order. Zara, how about you? Sure. Thank you for the question. Um, and thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Um, so yeah, your question on what we're missing or how that how that uh, tracks with our own studies and experience. So my, my focus has always been on kind of the digital aspects of Bangladeshi development. And it's clear that lots of global attention gets given to things like increased internet penetration or increased uh, mobile data, mobile internet penetration, that kind of thing, or even things like offering asylum to the Rohingya, um, even when the conditions that are offered are largely uh, inhumane. Um, on the digital front, I remember seeing some stories about, or like a, a surprising amount of Bangladeshi coverage about, or a surprising amount of global coverage about things like Bangladesh's first uh, satellite launch, which, was so much less important in my eyes than some of the other things going on that I know we'll talk about. Um, I guess from my perspective, the narratives are often around progress and very, very positive on the digital front um, without really acknowledging the much more messy truth that while both, for example, internet penetration is increasing, um, surveillance policies are also, are also being introduced into that digital space. So yeah, I'd say it definitely doesn't do justice to the, to the complex reality um, that we're seeing. Well, thank you for that. Uh, you know, one of the things that happens when Bangladeshis get together nowadays is turn off their mobile phones, uh, which is symptomatic of this. Uh, I was at the airport on the 6th. I just had a pre-COVID test and I had the test results with me with the government QR code. Uh, but when I showed it at the airport, they weren't impressed. They needed a printed paper with a rubber stamp with a seal. 
signature on it and a seal. So while we've gone digital in some senses, the old colonial hang-ups uh, haven't really changed so much. Uh, Russell, what about you? Yeah, um, very quickly, I, I guess I, ca I could um, talk about the um, renewed uh, global visibility of, um, let's say, um, transgender rights in Bangladesh, right? Um, we see lately that there are like trans um, uh, TV anchor are uh, uh, coming up in uh, popping over like all over the world and people are suddenly like there, there is this interest talking about like how Bangladesh is um, from like this uh, Muslim oppressive country to uh, a safe heaven for transgender people. But what is missing there, I think this kind of global um, coverage that we are we are getting, um, a friend of mine actually, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who is in Bangladesh, um, who is a non-binary person, and um, they have been trying to get this job, um, um, maybe one of the NGOs, because also like the Bangladeshi government introduced a tax cut, um, some kind of tax cut, if they have like a certain percentage of uh, trans people, if they hire a certain percentage of trans people, um, and this, my friend of mine is not uh, getting into that quota because uh, that person is not wearing sari during the interview, right? So, uh, so he, that that person is not fitting into into the imagination of transgender and hijra, and um, that is not there in the global coverage. That is missing in the global coverage. So, I think like global coverage is interesting, but also. Uh, as uh, Zara mentioned, that it's messy, and we really need to understand the complexity and messiness sometime. What about the violence? I mean, uh, with uh, the killings of, uh, I mean, you're involved in publication, but uh, we know of people who've actually met very violent ends uh, for being not in the binary system. I think I mean, if 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 I want to talk about violence in terms of uh, um, uh, in terms of global coverage, like it always gets a global coverage, right? When Zulhas and Tanoi they were murdered, like it received like worldwide attention. It came up uh, to all kind of global media. But I really want to. I would like to think that what does it do to us? You know, for the community, like what coverage brings to us. Um, at the end of the day, the way the violence is getting portrayed is only playing into the global imagination of uh, queer violence in a Muslim country, right? It's, 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 it's adding to that, but is it um, creating any kind, like is any kind of global coverage giving us like more uh, safe space uh, to express ourselves in Bangladesh? So what does it do to us? I think, you know, like we, we experience violence in Bangladesh pretty much common language, right? Like a common common knowledge. But um, what is what is not common knowledge is like this kind of uh, other forms of discrimination or other like intersectional forms of discrimination which doesn't come or like the global press or the global media that they don't sh they don't show much interest to cover. And that's a there is a lot there. I think uh, well, we can we can think about, um, yeah. On that note, I mean, in terms of what gets global coverage and what doesn't, uh, Veena, your take on this question? Thank you. Well, let me just thank the Himal team first, and thank you, Shaidul Pai, too. It's very refreshing to attend something that's not simply a celebration of what Bangladesh has achieved, but allows us, gives us the space to think about what's missing or what hasn't been done yet. Um, and I see some friends in the audience too, that's nice. I, I want to take a few minutes to talk about uh, this question and perhaps I'll talk less about other questions. Um, and I want to get back to the question of what kind of violence is globally, not all kinds of violence get global coverage at all. There's lots of violence that will never make it to the pages of the New York Times. And I want to end with that. But I want to begin with, the very um, curious place that Bangladesh has and the global imaginary, it's really like, a, it's lots of things to lots of people. It's an empty signifier, you could say. Uh, there are two kinds of global discourse I see that are there and they're enduring. There's the old kind that's been reconfigured, the natural disaster, 
and poverty thing. And this older story of Bangladesh as a place of misery, of cultural pathology, it's been re reconfigured. So recently, last year, for instance, Foreign Policy magazine had the most absurd article on um, Bangladesh is what it called Bangladesh's child marriage problem, which is the world's global sex trafficking problem. And it had, um, it was dripping with Orientalism in every photo, but it was trying to do something um, it was alarmist and sensationalist, and it, it was since the whole story was around reassuring, I don't know, um, a Euro-American audience about these places, these backward places and what needs to be done. There's that pity and alarm. There's another story, the more positive story about GDP and growth that you see and women's empowerment, right? I think that serves another ideological function globally. And we're not talking about Bangladesh because that's evidence of how Bangladesh's neoliberal capitalism works. Bangladesh is the poster child of this, a certain kind of development, uh, growth as development, if you will, right? It's Muslim, but moderate. It's poor, but flourishing. It's a bulwark against any kind of redistribution, socialism, communism, whatever you want to call it. And of course, against fundamentalism. This is why on all of this kind of coverage covers over the violence of the state, but also makes space for global capital to come in. It covers over the violence of capital too. And I think Bangladesh is a place of experimentation. It's whether it's the accord, which I, you know, which I write about in this special issue, the accord of on safety or whatever, or the long experiments in Matlab, and as Naomi Hussein has said, it's like an aid lab. All of this hides the enormous violence of development and the disposition that goes into development because those GDP figures, which were never meant to be anything but very crude measures, somehow have become a nationalist rallying point about how good, how, how well we're going. So it, of course, it's hiding violence, but it's doing a lot more globally. I'm always stunned by how um, Bangladesh is this empty space on which to other, you know, Europeans and Americans um, displace their anxiety. It's either backward and need saving, or look, it's our good development story. So that's, so that's how I see it. Thank you. And of course, today, the 10th, of December is the day when the democracy summit takes place where Bangladesh is excluded. And that talks about a, a shift as you suggest. But mm -hmm. we are in Bangladesh today. We, uh, it's, we have the road safety movement three years later back on the streets uh, and literally Dhaka has been on, in flames uh, recently. Uh, Khaled Azia might not survive uh, and this mm -hmm. This ping pong with uh, former prime minister uh, is bizarre that it's happening in this place. Again, just yesterday, a foul mouth minister had to leave. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the first one, but it might well be the first minister who was required to resign. But what an extreme situation had to come about before that happens. And we talk about women's empowerment. We talk about a woman prime minister, a woman leader of the opposition, yet you have a cabinet that can be so misogynic and get away with it. Uh, but let's talk in terms of journalism itself. Um, Rosina, uh, congratulations first on the Protomala Award you received last week, uh, and congratulations generally for sticking to your guns. But as, uh, as a journalist, what's your take on the question? So I can tell about journalism side only because I'm a journalist and in um, the pandemic uh, times, uh, the situation is so much crucial because you know, our 1600 uh, mass media employees lost their job during the pandemic. And in Bangladesh, 65% uh, journalists want to quit their, their job. So the, you know the situation uh, is now and you all know what happened with me. So if you say you women empowerment and women women prime minister in Bangladesh, so why why they uh, create that type of situation with us? 
So I think um, if we say Bangladesh in uh, a Bangladesh story within 15, 50 years, we can say women's situation uh, become same. Uh, if you treat like this, like we we uh, we we came first, but uh, our situation is not changed actually. Well, let's move on to something else. Um, I'll come back to you, Rosina, with more specific questions relating to journalism. Uh, there are articles in this series that looks at corruption, uh, the use of state authority, which of course uh, we saw with the ministers generally. But uh, journalists, writers, civil society at large, how have they responded uh, to what's been happening? Given the record of attacks and dissidents in investigative reporters by the state, how might that affect uh, the public scrutiny? Uh, you know, what should, how rather, should the public scrutiny uh, be designed and how would they seek accountability? I think the departure of the minister was a success, but then there is talk about how that was also engineered. And we never really know how the deep state is working in these situations. So I'll come back to Zara and we'll do that cycle again. Uh, always the first one. I see how this is going. <laughs> um, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. I mean, I think honestly, my, my panelists are among the civil society members who found the courage to speak truth to power and to try and draw attention to the issues of corruption that you mentioned while acknowledging that there have been these increased um, attacks and that they just face increased risk. And I think, again, I think the, the fellow, my fellow panelists are much better place to speak to this. Um, it seems to me like one clear tactic has been kind of getting attention or support on an international level as a kind of a form of protection and where possible, I guess, leveraging those international um, connections, uh, yeah, using that as a way of um, a, a kind of protection in a way. Um, another, I mean, as Shahid Ulbay uh, mentioned earlier, is people taking digital security precautions, like switching off your mobile phones, using encrypted um, platforms to communicate using second phones, but obviously that's very uh, specific to people who have the knowledge about what they can be doing on the digital front. Uh, people who have smartphones who can be using um, encrypted platforms. It really requires a lot of uh, access and privilege that many people don't have and just face many more risks. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, it, it's, a, it's a hard one, and I, I feel like other people are potentially better, better placed to answer this one. Russell, and maybe I'll bring you later on, Zara, next time. <laughs> um, I think I'm a big advocate of um, um, movements being fought locally, um, even though I'm not in Bangladesh. That's an irony. I, I, I was kicked out. Um, uh, that say i think like what i'm trying to say is that we have a civil society movement in bangladesh but the movement uh, in 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 past many years uh, um, has been ngoized up to a, a level that you know we only have uh, certain like uh, uh, device and techniques and tactics like like training and um and uh party m and um you know, finding out like this key population and groups uh, and provide them like what they need. So sort of like we segregated like different issues um, uh, in a way that we ha we are always looking for quick fix or like we are running some, uh, we, are run we are functioning in some kind of emergency mode all the time. We are only like responding to crisis, like the, the, the minister, like who just um, stepped down, you know, that was like this, this uh, a recent trend of social media justice which is which is happening the videos are getting viral and people are um uh, getting into only we are only holding people accountable when we see a video of uh, of that um uh, incident um what i meant by i think like local um like movement movement is to be built locally is that we have to develop this um idea of interconnectedness in 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 our oppression like how uh, different communities like indigenous communities or queer communities or, or um, um, the garments worker like who are fighting for their uh, wages or this misogyny we are seeing in this uh, current government who is, uh, that is led by a woman 
all of this needs to come together and we really have to understand that it's not a quick fix. Uh, we, I don't think like we will be able to you know, find a solution overnight, but what we have to understand that what is missing there, like when we are speaking for a community, who is missing there, who is not there, who is represented there, what is the power dynamic, like when we are fighting um, uh, for any kind of, when we're seeking for any kind of rights and justice. Uh, in, in our country, because we also have like some meta narrative of uh, oppression and and who are like the dissenters and like how they get treated. Like we also have a popular imagination of that. So we need to challenge that a little bit. And uh, that can happen when I think, in my opinion, I'm not saying like we need to abolish NGOs, but in my opinion, in my humble opinion, I think we need to really re-strategize the civil society movement and how the involvement of different different parties like Zara mentioned like international groups they are very I mean there are many international groups who are involved for uh, different reasons uh, in in Bangladesh but what is our strategy like how we are communicating with them and what kind of uh, what kind of prescriptions coming from them is really need to be investigated and uh, and um, and ha like find finding honestly finding our own voice more more and more like which can be all only found locally when we think like, think about the context and the politics well thank you for that you you mentioned training and per diem uh, <laughs> very popular things within the civil society uh, structure because it's linked with funding uh, and of course uh, you get constantly these rehash proposals with the same jargons being churned around. And that development is both a characteristic and a bane of Bangladesh. Um, yeah. We'll come back to that. Dina? Yeah, actually following up on those comments and what you just said, um, let me just speak about civil society is a concept that I think is um, very, um, bereft of power when we we don't you know we really need to realize that um, civil society the very idea is um, it seems very neutral but these civil what is civil society it's you know at this point it's been reduced to NGOs I mean you're talking about NGOization you know that's what we have and um, the to me, it seems civil society is a deeply depoliticized kind of entity, so it can only ask certain kinds of questions because of the funding constraints, I suppose. But, it, but it's, there's a deep discomfort to question things like development in civil society. And I, um, it, for instance, if you look at the movements, the social movements that have really questioned inequality or disposition, they haven't come from civil society at all. This thing that Anumamad and others run, the uh, oil, gas, and other natural resources committee, it came from outside of so-called civil society. Because if you were in civil society, you would be silenced. You wouldn't be allowed to ask certain kinds of questions, otherwise you'd be out of a job. So I think we need to not celebrate civil society. We need to really rethink why that's what we, you know, um, fall back on. Who sees and who gets hurt? That's the other thing. We also have civil society as in think tanks and other um, institutions who have voice and respectability in society and who crowd out the other less popular voices. And that too is an issue. So I don't think there's a one hour voice at all. I think there are hegemonic voices inside Bangladesh that take up a lot of space and don't allow the less uh, popular voices to come out. I am very wary of international groups. They're in, you know, international groups have their own agendas, right? And they will ally as the, um, as happened with the garment workers, they'll ally with some groups and not others because of their agenda. So one has to be very careful thinking about this. In terms of the minister, I mean, the resignation doesn't really change the structure. The resignation is also very performative, it seems to me. I mean, it's a huge victory at the same time. I don't want to undercut the victory, but it seems to me there's a lot more work that needs to go into it. This minister managed, you know, found himself in a awkward position and it was politically awkward to keep him. This has nothing to do with really changing 
feminist understandings or understandings of gender and sexuality and patriarchy in Bangladesh, which somebody like Rehnuma Ahmed can talk about. But she's again, she's outside of that system. She can talk about what she says. She has this wonderful term, killing kiko, killing kikorun, of scandalizing, you know, using scandal to bring people down politically, which again just reinforces older patriarchal motives. Anyway, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Well, you mentioned um, the role of the NGOs. There is the NGO Bureau, which is the other repressive uh, yeah. entity that they all have to do. In our own case, three, 30 years, over 30 years ago, made a very conscious decision of not being an NGO because we felt had we become so, yeah. we would also be neutered in that way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. NGOs talk about being non-political. How can the control of resources in a country like this be a yeah. non-political position? Absolutely. Uh, but uh, you mentioned the minister, and I'd just like to point out something which I am concerned about. He was told to resign, and he did. But the fact that here is a minister who actually uh, says he will rape a person in, uh, in conversation and use the security forces to reel her in, unless yes. she uh, accommodates. Yet, right. this is a criminal offence and nothing has been done on that. Exactly. Um, Rosina, would you like to talk on that or we could come back? I mean, you've been a, a victim on the other end. Yeah, uh, they uh, published the news. The, the minister is going to Canada. The minister is in the plane. The minister is in the airport. So what actually we did, we journalists, uh, we journalists should, uh, can uh, do lots of things. Uh, we can protest, we can write. Uh, he is a criminal. Uh, why he left Bangladesh in this time? See, uh, they kept my passport when I got bail. I'm not criminal, I'm a journalist. And uh, I, I, when I got a free press award, I, I was not able to go to Netherlands. And every day, uh, every week I have to go to the court for this reason. Uh, they didn't uh, hear me. They just said, okay, finish, finish, finish. Okay, next court, next court, next court. And mm -hmm. the criminal, uh, what we have seen and heard, we know everything. But the prime minister uh, says, okay, he resigned. Resigning is not the punishment. Before, we, I, I have written so many stories, like six secretary, uh, they... Uh, got a uh, like freedom fighter certificate. It, it was its false certificate. Uh, they resigned, but they never get punished. Uh, so, so to, you see the situation. If if he is a minister or secretary, uh, they will get the reward to go to Canada and stay there very warmly. And if we are a journalist and we are a uh, normal people, we have to stay here home. We can't write and we can't move anywhere. So now you can see the situation in Bangladesh. And that's the difference, actually. Well, thank you for that, Rosina. Uh, my own case is being heard right now. Yesterday, there was a hearing, and it's continuing. Three years after the event, they've not been able to file, uh, lodge the case itself uh, or submit uh, their, their accusation uh, in, in terms of what you meant to submit in court. But... I won't go into that. I'll just change the sequence a little bit, Dina, because Zara can now be at the end. Would you like to uh, come back to a different question, uh, which, you know, what I'm going to do is uh, bring up some general questions and then, then, then come to specific things. Uh, but this relates to what you talked about, because uh, you talked a lot about civil society. It's been described as an idealized independent space of public spirited citizens uh, but it really hasn't played that role to that extent and now for me what is of great concern is not so much the repression that the government is doing but the silence of so many people who should be speaking out at a time like this and of course it is a very divided society in, in mm -hmm. terms of army league and bnp but even outside of that uh, yeah. So, can I, do you have a further comment on that? I do, actually. Oh, are you asking me? It's so hard yes, to tell please. sometimes. <laughs> also, it's very early in the morning for me, as I was telling people. Um, yes, I actually wanted to, your comment on the 
minister again reminded me, and this is related to what you're saying, is that this um, what he said about using RAB or whatever the forces to bring w- women in if they would not submit, right? Yeah. It's basically a naked exercise of power, right? And that is what is not being confronted, I think, when he's resigned, he gets to go off, as Rosina pointed out, right? He gets to, you know, be taken out of the picture is basically all that's happened. But the way in which the current government in particular, but perhaps, you know, other, gov- you know, other ruling parties have done that too, the way in which the country runs right now, we could say it's a Gunda Raj that's come to the surface, right? You don't need, as somebody, some minister said, you don't need, we don't need to call thugs anymore. Somebody said, you know, we have, you know, we have RAB. But the, it's the, the culture of fear and the silence that I want to, that this made me think of, which is, for instance, we just heard about the Abrar case in which 20 people were sentenced to death, right? Um, that's great. I don't believe in the death penalty. It's great that something has come out of it. What, if we leave the case there, I think it's very, very problematic because we know that this young boy was beaten all night. We know everybody in the hostel heard. We know that they knew he was being literally killed. Nobody intervened, including those in higher power who could have, should have. That says something about, it's not corruption, it's something bigger than corruption, about the system in which when you can speak up, when you can intervene, when you protect, when you don't. And we do live in this enormous culture of fear. And it's that culture of fear that doesn't get addressed if we're just going to celebrate 20 people being put to death. That, that doesn't stop the system from reproducing itself in a different way. And why, and if he had been Jamaat Shibir, that would not have made it okay anyway, right? So there are a lot of questions that don't get answered um, and it, that are totally related to, and I think there's real fear. I, that will make, you know, this story would make anybody feel like they can't go out. And I here, I think it's, I really have, so much respect for people on the ground who don't have, you know, the cultural capital of speaking in English and having friends everywhere. You know, it's, I, it's easy for me to say what I'm saying. I, I want to acknowledge my privilege in being able to say this sitting in New York, right? And I understand how much harder it is when you're in Bangladesh and so much more is at stake. So, well, absolutely. Thank, Thank you for that. Yeah. Quickly Sorry? respond to Dina. Can I quickly respond to Dina? Dina's point. Ah. Please, please do. So I think, yes, this is about power, but this is also about, I mean, particularly in this case of this government uh, who is in power illegally for less more than 10 years, uh, is also, also about this uh, image of this government that secularism, which is like a driving, it has become like, you know, this meta identity crisis that uh, if, is Bangladesh secular or Muslim. So that can be only granted under fascism. Like, is that what we are proposing? So that, that's what happening in, in, in Bangladesh, that if this government falls, right, like what, who is going to take over? Is the mullahs <laughs> and the Islamists. Well, they're gonna, I, I, they're... Yeah, I mean, but that's what I said, that Bangladesh is, um, it's seen as this bulwark against Islamic fundamentalism and jihad, and that gives very governments so much cover to do what they want because frankly the donors are very interested in keeping the capitalists in power so they will look away so some kinds of violence the violence on gendered sexed bodies will make it to the new york times and other kinds of violence won't so uh, yeah well it's good this is becoming more conversational which is what we <laughs> intended it to be in, in the first place so uh, thanks for butting in, Russell, and thanks for following up. Uh, Dina, Zara, I kept my word and kept you till last. Now it's your turn. <laughs> oh, um, no, thank you. <laughs> no, I mean, I completely agree with what Dina and Russell have, have said. I think it's interesting to consider who has the incentive right now in this culture of fear to actually speak up. And I think 
within the largely depoliticized NGO space, it isn't them because they don't want to, as, you, as I think Dina said earlier, they don't want to lose jobs. They don't want to, um, you know, rock the rock the boat, so to speak. Um, so there's a complete lack of, yeah, I guess lack of incentive and lack of incentive to question the very, very colonial roots of international development, how they, how a new middle class has emerged that has gained the, the cultural capital, the ability to, to play the NGO game, to, to set up NGOs, to know how to apply for funding, that kind of thing. And, and thinking about who's deciding those funding priorities, because obviously it's not coming from inside the country. Um, and that's a harder one to, I mean, I guess, it, it, yeah, it's, I think it's important to, to try and understand where that power is operating and how it's operating on people and within, within the NGO space and within civil society, as we've called it, or as, as it gets called. Um, but yeah, and I, don't, I just don't think, it, I think it's important not to forget the, how this space came to be, colonial roots, colonial history, how, how power is operating in much the same way that it did in his like historically but just under different labels and with different um different people leading the charge in many ways um i like dina's um description of this being a kind of naked exercise of power because it's also how we see digital technology being leveraged um that they're getting trying to get as many people online as possible which is seen as a you know a part of the sustainable development goals very progressive in terms of the aid space uh, but then also using digital technology to surveil and monitor and silence and having this huge chilling effect, um, which in combination with the very real offline, you know, uh, people being sentenced to death, that kind of um, all the things that we've talked about already has such a such a huge, huge chilling effect that we have things uh, like the events that we've talked about already today. Um, uh, while we're with you, uh, you did mention yourself surveillance. Uh, we didn't go into de depth about the Digital Security Act, which over the past few years have, has really dominated the scene in terms of what it's done to journalists, to activists, to free thinkers. Uh, are there other worrying policies and developments regarding data surveillance automation uh, on digital services that we should be thinking about? Yes, huge. So, so many. I mean, I think the Digital Security Act gets uh, rightly a lot of the attention, but there's also other things like the government of Bangladesh has been found to be purchasing spyware from Israel or an Israeli company, which given that they are one of the few countries who don't officially recognize Israel is is ironic. And uh, I mean, on, on many levels, but not, not surprising, I guess. Um, I mean, there's been use of Internet shutdowns, of social media blackouts. Um, all sorts of, you know, I think even the introduction of um, the national ID cards that, are, that have biometric uh, data associated with them can also contribute to this chilling effect because people, you know, having to use your, your national ID card to access key government services and to access increasingly private sector services as well, needing it to purchase a SIM card, for example, uh, knowing that it's associated with your, your very body, your, your bodily data that can never be changed, that is completely immutable and will stay with you throughout your life, um, is a different level of, of surveillance beyond just, you know, your phone records being tapped or something like that. Um, and that's also, again, another kind of colonial hang up in a way. It's the state wanting to make its subjects, its citizens as visible as possible to the state in a certain way. It, the introduction of digital ID has been largely pushed by international financial institutions like the World Bank. Um, they've been used in different ways to surveil and to, to monitor activities. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's many, many uh, oppressive digital policies that we should be aware of, but obviously the, the Digital Security Act is a huge one. Well, Rosina, I'll come to you because uh, uh, one of the reasons that have been used to to get much of this data is COVID. The pandemic has actually made it acceptable to uh, impinge upon our privacy in ways we would never have accepted before, not just in Bangladesh, but across the globe. Mm. But you've been reporting on the health sector during the pandemic. Uh, would you say there's a difference in terms of how your reporting has been received? And the health sector has come under increased uh, scrutiny, but journalists have also been arrested because of reporting on huge corruption within the health system. 
Has the health system always been a politicized issue? Uh, actually, I, I, I am not a health reporter. I was I covered actually home ministry before. Mm. Uh, when COVID came and, and we saw everywhere corruption, my editor said, okay, go health ministry and do some reporting. Uh, so I, I, I used to go secretariat like last like 16 years. I know everyone. Uh, mm. So uh, uh, when I started my uh, uh, story, uh, I, I went there uh, like uh, 10 days. Uh, so I saw there is no officers there, no secretaries there, no ministers there, and the doctor working very hard. So I have written a story, my first story, health minister not going to office. Uh, so after, after that day, he came to office. He joined this office and he, he said, Okay, office is not no, office is not like that. We I have to come every day in secretariat. I can uh, uh, I can work from home also. So that day I started work and I saw I saw so many uh, stories is there. When I asked myself where I am, where I was. Uh, there is the Bhandar <laughs> is the total Bangla. So I started reporting and I saw so many corruption irregularities. Every side, if if you uh, uh, if uh, um, uh, equipment, uh, uh, products, and corruption, uh, corruption is everywhere. Whenever I start uh, re, uh, writing a story about uh, uh, recruitment, the official said the recruitment was not correctly uh, happening because every candidates they get hundred percent marks and their writing was so good. So he. Uh, saying, she sends a letter to the secretary and says, I saw the, the gate, 100% marks, but when I called them, uh, called them in the um, uh, exam, uh, they didn't say anything. They say, like, I eat rice. They can't say what's the meaning. So I have written this story after the, the health minister was so angry. And uh, after that day, he stopped talking with me. And after, after the 24 days, uh, everything happened with me, and I saw they are not very. Uh, they are mothers. Journalists, they are not very, very, very usual with journalists. Maybe journalists don't used to come to the uh, health ministry. They, uh, they, are, they work their, uh, their type. And I saw one thing. Uh, they don't know who is doing what. There is no connection with one officer to another officer. Uh, uh, secretary, the secretary changed three or four times within one year, and minister say secretary, secretary, secretary say secretary, ministers. So horrible situation. So I saw in the panoramic panoramic time is the best time in reporting for uh, the, this side. But after that, they stopped me. Last six month, I didn't write anything. There are some people say don't to write anything about health ministry because of my case. So I, I didn't see any news, any corruption news in the newspaper for six months like that way. Thank you. Russell, uh, we did a yep. show called Positive Lives uh, many years ago, um, in 1996, in fact, when we showed on, we exhibited pictures of gay people. But at that time, they were scared about showing their identity. Later on, they became more comfortable with a sort of coming out event, but Bangladesh has come a long way. Uh, you've used a different form. You've used oral history as a form, as opposed to say a film or a photo essay. Uh, what, how did you make people comfortable to share their stories? How did they open up to you? Uh, and in terms of the LGBTIQ community, um, what do you see happening in terms of them expressing their identity, giving that their identity is criminalized within Bangladesh. Um, I actually wanted to also respond quickly, very quickly, Rosina, about that like you, what you are doing is kick ass. And um, at the same time, you know, we are so used to with like health corruption and LGED corruption and transportation minister is like, you know, receiving bribes. 
So, I mean, I'm rather surprised that this news actually, you know, got so much attention because when we see this kind of news, we don't pay any attention. We want to only read about Pori Moni, right? So, <laughs> good job on that. Great job. Um, uh, Shoydul Bhai, coming to your question about like uh, the, um, the event and how did we approach the community and use the format of oral history? Honestly, I mean, um, we did not convince anyone. Uh, this is our story. Uh, we are part of the community. Uh, the people we approached in this project, uh, the oral, uh, the oral history project, um, um, are all friends, uh, and we are members. We are sort of like um, in the same boat in 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 different ways. You know, a, a friend of mine actually said something very interesting a couple of days ago that we are in the same storm in different boats. So maybe that's a better metaphor. <laughs> um, uh, what happens, I think, in this kind of format, or like, you know, if you ask me why oral history, why not documentary, I think it, it wasn't meant to be uh, documented. And uh, we, used a, we used a format of archiving, and I have to mention this, like, before I go forward, that this was a project that we received a grant from uh, uh, South, Asian, uh, South Asian American Digital Archive, and it was in collaboration with uh, Queer Archives of Bengal Delta, which is a, a, a which is an archiving platform uh, uh, co-founded by me and Ifadul Haq, and that project specifically was led by Ifadul Haq, who is uh, uh, my sort of partner in crime. Um, so the oral history uh, project was really, uh, I think, a long-term conversation which was happening in that organization, the platform, CAB, the Queer Archives of Be uh, Bengal Delta. I just mentioned. Uh, and we were thinking a lot about history, you know, that it is not just the queer people are getting marginalized, but it is also like the queer history, which is getting marginalized in, in Bangladesh and in many other places. And we, uh, we really uh, thought archiving as a questioning format, to be very honest, because, you know, what is our like popular imagination of archive, that archive is a place which uh, accumulates uh, and it's, it's sort of a repository of like historical data and documents, right? Uh, this is a place where we do indexing, where do where we do cataloging. We have metadata. We have um, like you know acquisition, uh, uh, acquiring policy, and like a lot of uh, I think uh, paperwork that goes into it. A lot of organizing. So archive, like to me, is a kind of a metaphor of order and recognition. And, and speaking of queer community, this is nothing of that sort, right? We don't have like external validation. We don't have like order in our categorization. It's very messy. And when we thought about archive, we really thought about that messiness and playing around with that messiness that we don't have all these boxes where we can create like, you know, this is that and who is who. Um, and also another thing about archive is that it's, it's sort of, a place where we look into our past, but what is our past? Like like queer people, like queer people of Bangladesh, we don't have a past. I mean, our past is absent. We have a past, but we don't have the access to it because we are getting erased continually. Even now, like we, we are an online space, like and Zara talked about like the surveillance and everything. So every time we send a message, we, are, we also make sure that we delete it, right? So we are like continually erasing our present. So how can we, then think of our past. And that's where I think the format of oral history and the understanding of archive came into that we really have to, we really had to reimagine the format of archiving. Um, that what is, uh, what is archiving, like in, in popular sense, whatever archiving means doesn't fit us. So we have to reclaim the space because we do want to think about our history and our politics and understand like what it means for us. So archive then became a site of, uh, forming solidarity and collaboration and archive became a space of intimacy and sharing our trauma and 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 understanding our politics to to some extent reflect on like you know what happened so through this oral history project for example like I got to really reflect on my involvement with Rupert magazine right and it's uh, it's very past it's it's near near past it's not like past past it's been only like six seven years now so that is that is really like um a sort of like reclamation of the idea of thinking of like uh, what happened 50 years ago, rather than that, like we can only, we get to only think about like what happened in five years ago. Um, and I think like what oral history did, like it, it gave us the space uh, be, uh, to um, design that 
you know, like the imagination, like the or reimagination of archive a little bit more because by the definition of oral history, it removes the face. I mean, we don't see the face, right? So, um, and some of the participants who uh, were interviewed in this oral history project, they also asked for a different kind of manipulation. They said like, you know, change the pitch of the voice because we don't want to be recognized. Um, we have like some artwork in this oral history exhibit, which, which is again, an imaginary form of uh, responses that the artist worked on based on the interview when the artist uh, uh, listened to all the interviews and responded as an art form. And that seemed to me also a new kind of archive, like a fictional archive, right? So we tried to fictionalize the archive because we uh, really thought that like we don't have enough data and we don't want to like, you know, like document data through our archive. We really wanted to make it a space where we connected, uh, uh, connected with each other. And that's why, that's why oral history, I think like was one of the formats that gave us the freedom to do it, the, do the manipulation and understand like, you know, each other a little bit more. It wasn't designed, it wasn't planned. We did not approach anyone. Hey, we are going to come up with this 10 different questions and how are you going to how are you going to respond that was not the case we were really having a chat uh, sharing our memories and um, not sharing information well, you did a project without a preset questionnaire without a feasibility study without uh, a time frame and all the things you're meant to do in all projects well congratulations uh, there can is I, can i jump, jump in quickly sorry yes please Sure. I just want to say to Rasa, I, I really love the archiving project that you've taken control of the narrative and, and being able to categorize or not categorize the stories in a way that makes sense to you. Because I don't know, I guess in my work, I've seen how categorization or kind of adding metadata by the state can also be a form of violence or a way that power is exhibited or manifested on people. So it's incredible to see um, that power being taken back and those stories being being reimagined as you said in a way that makes sense i mean you also mentioned earlier that uh it's it's things it's video evidence that uh often draws people's or it's evidence that is recorded that gets people's attention on things um and that mention also raised the question for me of what injustices are happening that aren't being recorded or what what, what stories are there that aren't being recorded right now so yeah i just i love the love the archiving thank you thank you Sarah. What I'll do, uh, we will go on to the Q&A, but I have just one question for Dina, and then we move on to the Q&A. Hopefully, the team will be sending me those questions. Uh, Dina, Bangladesh obviously plays an important role in terms of the global supply chain, particularly when it comes to garments. Uh, but is the lack of effective political opposition in the country a problem? Uh, we have, we've talked about Bangladesh a lot, what we've not talked about is cross-border solidarities. Do you think that could make a difference? How can we as citizens strengthen our position? Are there forms of internationalism uh, which could be realistic perhaps? Uh, those are very good questions. Um, let me begin by saying that I think we need to, um, talking of controlling the narrative, I think we need to change the terms of debate, how we think about the garment industry in Bangladesh and globally. So in Bangladesh, the focus is very much on factory owners. In North America, where I live, the focus is on the brands. And the analysis is, even though we talk about the supply chain, so the analysis is made in these uh, very separate ways. And I think we really know, need to look first at what the, the, how the supply chain works and how that ends up reinforcing basically um, the power of the capitalists on top and ends up completely um, super exploiting the bodies at the bottom, which are the garment workers. And let me just, so it, I, we need to know that if we want to, we need to understand this more. If we want to have cross-border solidarity that isn't just about a kind of one-way paternalism like you know there's so much I have young students here who want to help Bangladeshi workers I discourage this language of helping people in the so-called global south um, I think um, I want to let's take something like the accord which was seen as the accord on fire safety 
and building safety in Bangladesh, which came in after Rana Plaza, right? It was meant to be a game changer. If you look at it, it was a, it's a, I find it a very problematic thing, not because Bangladeshi factories don't need to have all of the remediation that they've had, but because how, of how they reinforce this global power structure. So the problem is always a local problem. The problem is this um, problem is within the boundaries and borders of Bangladesh. So it's the Bangladeshi factories that um, factory owners who are so greedy and I'm not, I'm not supporting, I hope by now you know that I'm not a raging capitalist, but it's, it is important to realize that when you think of why Rana Plaza happened, if you only think it's bad governance on the terms of Bangladesh, you forget how the supply chain operates every day. And it operates by putting increasing pressure on local suppliers. And the people who benefit the most are the Euro-American brands. And what, so what I really, in my article for um, Himal, what I've tried to so, show is that the supply chain, it, you know, the whole metaphor of the supply chain is that all links in the chain are equal. Actually, they're not equal, right? There's a, and what the accord did was it, it re, redistributed blame just to the local or the national. But you didn't see what, how, um, fact, uh, how brands were implicated in the desperation that Bangladeshi factory, the kind, the tight deadlines on which Bangladeshi factories have to run to maintain their con contracts and to maintain their contracts, what they do is they they put enormous and completely inhuman pressure on their workers to produce more and more because their lead times get shorter and shorter. What happened after Rana Plaza, despite the accord, and I think what to me is the more scandalous thing is that um, brands seeing that Bangladeshi um, companies, Bangladeshi suppliers were in a vulnerable position, brands began to pay Bangladeshi suppliers 17% less, and there are st studies on this per item, I think it was just trousers, than they did before Rana Plaza. What did Bangladeshi factory owners do? They cut down on their workforces, they increased quotas, they didn't want to lose their um, profits. But it's, I, I don't understand why we're not also talking about the whole supply chain. It's, I think what we need to do is reframe the debate to think about how supply chain, this, idea of the supply chain is deeply, deeply problematic as it works today. And I'm not saying we shouldn't, we should stop production. I'm not saying we should stop exports, but I think we need to think about what is it that is really scandalous about the system? Yes, the Rana Plaza collapse was scandalous, but we need to think about um, how, why that happened. The workers, and I'm sure lots of people have said this before, why is it that in the Rana Plaza building, the banks closed down, the shops closed down, the garment in the factories did not close down? That's not local malgovernance. That's not because of anything else. That's because there's a, there's a relationship between the global and the national. That we, if we want to have cross-border solidarity, I think instead of asking for um, higher wages in Bangladesh, which is very important, and there's something called the Asia Floor Wage Alliance, that's um, alliance of countries, garment producing countries, where trade unions go to come together, and they're doing that work. If you want international solidarity, that's North-South solidarity, I think you need to talk to, you know, People, I, I, maybe this is the wrong audience, and I'm used to talking to North American audiences. You need to talk about tariffs. You need to talk about increasing prices paid to, you know, Bangladeshi factory suppliers, and ensuring that goes to increasing wages and better working conditions. Anyway, I can. I'm sorry, I can go off on a rant on this, but um, I'll stop. No, thank you for bringing that up. That was. Very important. And I, I want to move on to the Q&A, but you actually talked of an accord. One of the accords that hasn't really been talked about in this session so much is the peace treaty or yeah. the Hill Tracks. Perhaps we could touch on that. And I have a question 
on the environment by Asmal Hussain, and I'll just read that out, um, and perhaps we could look at that. Uh, I'm, I, it's a long question, so I'm not going to talk about all of it, but for example, we talked about Abra Case, who was beaten until he died, but the question is, why was he beaten? He wrote about India's hydrohegemony over Bangladesh. This yes. is the similar situation for the environmental activists fighting against Rampal coal-fired power plants adjacent to the Sundarbans. So environment and the Chittagong Hill tracks. Anyone want to take that up? It's open. Right. Um, I don't have anything hugely cogent to say, perhaps. I was very struck by that India connection, but again, um, it's not just an India connection, it's the it's a connection of capital investments into Bangladesh. What is it's interesting for us to think about what can be critiqued and what can't be critiqued, right? And what will get protection and what won't get protection. So it's sort of it seems that in the current dispensation, it's okay to beat somebody up if they're Jamaat Shibir, and it's okay to beat somebody up if they go against the current. Um, economic ideology, which is so tied into a particular peculiar historical relationship Bangladesh has with um, India. Um, so it's very, uh, I, I think it's a very troubling thing that I, I think the Abrar case, I've been really been thinking about it. Like, how is it that there's a, um, I just read an article in which somebody argues, an academic argues that in a sense, Abrar was racialized as a Muslim, and this is going beyond this, this idea that he's pro Jamaat gives a certain license to do whatever you want with him. But the India question, I think, is a much more important question in this, and it shows how national policy is enforced uh, inside the university, national economic policy is sort of, it's made sure that nobody can speak out against it. And these are the things, it's just that these kids got out of hand. We know this happens all the time, right? Uh, I would like to remind uh, the other participants, there are lots of the very interesting people that I can see on this uh, screen of mine, uh, to ask other questions, if you may, please feel free to put it on the, in the chat or, in the Q&A section, but I, I did talk about uh, the Chittagong Hill Tracks, I talked about environment, those are issues we've not really dealt with so much. Another thing which is, and um, Dina mentioned taboos, another taboo we have, particularly in the media, who's not allowed to talk about at all, is the military. You never yeah. talk about the military. So these are these uh, un, you know, unspeakable spaces uh, that we confront. Maybe this is the time to talk about them. Anyone? I mean, I guess like it's no longer like only the military. It's also the Sheikh Hasina, the Amili government, the uh, nation of uh, father of the nation, right? Ne not nation. <laughs> so it's big, like the uh, list uh, keeps growing. So I think that, that is uh, so much to think about like the structure, like how we function. I mean, I can only give an example of my family, for example. My family, like my my both of my parents, they were like Aumilik BNP. Like, you know, one of them was Aumilik and one of them was BNP. And they, we always saw this like tension between my mother. My mother is like the more secular, more progressive, and the father is like more Islamist and all of that, right? Like that, that fight was going on. But suddenly what happened, not suddenly, like in last 10 years, like incrementally, like my father became more and more pro-Aumilik. Pro and now my father is convinced that Aumilik is the right government in, in, in Bangladesh. And this is really, I think it's not the government, but it's the government mentality that we have, right? Like, it's like our submission to power. Like we are as a nation, like this is, the, we, we have a culture where we um, kind of like encourage uh, and celebrate power. And this is happening all over. This is why we have like so much social media justice, honestly, because there is this power of viral culture that everyone saw, like, you know, sees something and then they talk about the justice, like how can we do, we do justice? 
so uh, i think there is there is uh, even even like when we talked about like hydro hegemony indian hydro hegemony like what about the hegemony in academia uh, and the gatekeeping in academia what about the hegemony in artist community right like you you mentioned that there was this uh, what was that event uh, positive light right like when uh, queer community members like they were they were shown without faces um I mean, we are getting approached by artists and uh, scholars and activists, like queer community members all the time, right? Um, but what do we get out of that? Where is that power? Like, you know, how do we address that power balance? Like, you know, like who is shown, who is not shown, who is visible, whose story is there? What Dina mentioned that this, this, uh, this uh, international media, like um, a madness, like every time they see something happening in the queer community in Bangladesh, because the celebrity is really high. You know, yeah. either it's like a transgender person is uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. reading uh, the, the uh, anchoring uh, news or a queer person, or like a gay man getting slaughtered. You know, the, the, the TRP is really high. So we really have to, I think, question like hegemony in every kind of, um, every mode of existence, I think, in Bangladesh and our, our, our nature to submit to power. Like we saw this documentary that, that broke into like, you know, our, our space, our private space, which criticized the army and like showed like mm-hmm. some of the things in a very like drama- hyper-dramatized way. But what was the response? Like, you know, how did we respond? And we saw like how most of the major newspaper was actually defending the government, right? And actually sort of scrutinizing that how this documentary was like Western funded and all this narrative that they don't often use against the government. So. I think there is a cultural shift that needs to happen uh, in terms of our fascination for power. Mm. I'd like to, I mean, one of the benefits of being a moderator is you can butt in when you want. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to talk about the media itself. I mean, perhaps you could do it, Rosina, but others could as well. Uh, The media job is to be questioning, but we've come to a place where the media has effectively become a spokesperson for the government itself. So much of government spiel is churned out by the media. I recognize that this was bad. I never realized it was this bad until it came to the prime minister's birthday. And we saw all (laughs) these newspapers, which were basically fashion parades. No, including yours, exactly. And, you know, I, I wrote to one editor to say how ashamed I was And he responded by saying, well, I have a lot of respect for you. Uh, Sorry you feel that way. He didn't actually try uh, even talk about the pressures that were on him. And that really, except for one newspaper, I think, New Age, which put this story in, a small story in page three, every other newspaper had supplements. And the supplements were free. They were forced to run free supplements on this issue. So the media becoming so supplicant in a situation like that is extremely worrying. But I'll come on to a couple of questions. One which relates to both uh, archiving and surve- surveillance, uh, which perhaps Zara or Russell could re- uh, respond to. It's by Saad Hamad. And he, he mentions that the phone leak in the case of the minister is not the first phone leak. Who leaks them? Who archives them? Who <laughs> is able to do them? Uh, that's a very pertinent question because it's a tip of the iceberg. Yeah, I mean, I think it goes to what Russell was mentioned, mentioning earlier. There's just so many, there's so many ways in which this corruption, there's just so much. It's hard, it's impossible to expect everyone to keep attention on every single phone leak, to keep attention on every single mention of corruption or or behaviour that isn't democratic, or that is draconian or authoritarian. And I mean, I guess it's it, it, ideally in a in a in an open democracy in a free democracy, it would be the role of the fourth estate of journalism to be holding accountable, to be receiving those leaks, um, and to try and the role of civil society to try and use those to push for systemic change instead of just a performative resignation or a performative something at the tip of the iceberg that doesn't address the kind of roots of that of that corruption. Um, but I think now what, what we see right now, and I think Russell also mentioned this earlier, is this kind of social media justice, um, which is a is a consequence of how the information kind of regime or the information space is, is structured. And I think, and it also, I mean, I also just wanted to mention something that I was thinking about earlier of, that we haven't we haven't mentioned is how 
is kind of how the role of misinformation and disinformation that's spread by the government in order to influence cultural shifts or narratives. Um, there was a report, uh, I think, earlier this year, actually, about how the government has started already training um, training people to be a kind of online online activist to prevent rumours and disinformation ahead of the, the next general election, which I think also deserves some uh, concern and attention and, yeah, potentially discussion too. And the elections, regardless of what sort of form they take, are not that far away and one party is definitely preparing for it. What are the others doing? What are citizens doing in preparation? I, I have another question, but I can would I, like... Can I quickly... Marley. Yes, of course. Can I quickly respond to Saad? Saad, I mean, the thing is that we know it's kind of common knowledge that the government is listening to us. <laughs> it's it's happening in Bangladesh. It's I'm in America and I feel the same here. I think the yeah. social media is like recording us. Uh, all the like all the institution that is in power, they are in power. They have the capacity actually to to record, to archive, to collect, to see us, you know, the naked us. And then like if they get benefit out of that, like they release some leak, some of this information, for example, like even in this minister case now, um, um, the actor whose phone was involved, Imon, like he's getting interrogated by DB police, but no one was interrogated when, um, what was the, 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 uh, the person, the, the, um, he, uh, Hefazat Islam guy, like he was, he was arrested and then like the government, like, you know, or I don't know who, like everyone, like there were like multiple recording playing on Akatu television. There was no investigation as such, like no one was called, uh, the how they leaked uh, the phone, phone conversation. So it's, it's, it has become such a culture that we never, you know, like we never question that who has the recording, who is listening to us and why they're, why they're releasing it because we all know uh, how is uh, how it's happening? Um, Can I just add something? That? One sorry, second. Please, you know. yeah. Sorry, sorry. Um, I guess yes. Uh, I it it really is also about the corporatization of media. It's simply not. It's not just our culture necessarily. What stories get investigated and what stories don't really depend on who owns the media. <laughs> and what their interests are, and certainly people who own the media, their interests are not to unsettle the government, not to question the government. They're happy to let out multiple, you know, copies of whatever, the Hafazad guy doing whatever. It's totally in their interest. And I think we have to remember that. I mean, there's a, what stories make it is really important. So the BGMEA, for instance, has journalism fellowships for people, which is fine. But you once you have a journalism fellowship from the BGMEA, you will have a certain, perhaps, you know, there, there's something there to think about, right? So there's that we really, it's, there's so much, so many corporate interests working directly and indirectly in telling us how to think, in what stories get elevated and what stories are absolutely, unco you know, uh, not silenced, erased. So that's just a very small point. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if Rosina wants to talk specifically about the journalism thing, but while we do that, and there are a couple of other questions I want to bring up, I do want to uh, provoke you into perhaps talking about the things we haven't talked about. The Chittagong Hill tracks, the indigenous community and the environment. I think those are important issues that need to come up I realize there might not be anyone with a special expertise on that area, but your comments, and since this is about Bangladesh, I don't think those yeah. can be uh, not, not discussed. But uh, there is something about internationalism, which has been questioned by Archid Guha. How do we conceive of Bangladesh and its role in South Asia as a region, especially as it has shifted over the past 50 years and the meta-narrative of success associated with Bangladesh today? While you think, maybe I'll read out another question and you can decide which ones you go for. This one's for Russell. I was intrigued by your point about archives and that the idea of a queer past challenges our basic notion of archives and that the event in the present digital erasure is dominant or necessary. At the same time, there's the idea we all often use of uncovering hidden past and the idea that the marginalized always existed and have a rich past. How does the idea 
having no past fit with the notion of uncovering hidden histories. There's one other question. I will just read it out and then I'll leave it up to you to decide which one you handle. This is by Kaiser Kabir. Is there any hope that the disenfranchisement of the population shall be reversed in the near future? Uh, Samada mentioned, Archita mentioned, the last question about for Russell was from Pranob Roy. Pranjan. Anyone? Can, oh, Russell, do you want to answer your question? Because yeah. uh, I want I to say something about the Chittagong Hill tracks, but you should go ahead. Yeah, very quickly, Pranav. Like, I think uh, when we think about like having no past to having a rich past, so there are like it's like this, this binary, like we definitely had a past. But when we think about like a rich past, that feels to me a little voyeuristic. And that it, like that imagination often comes from, I think, this imperialist fascination that how we see our exoticized like uh, the past of certain communities. So there is that that kind of dynamic is always there, right? Like what we think about when we think about our past i think what what we need to do is really have to understand like the collectivity and our our involvement our our stake in in, in that past not only just exotic either exoticize it or invisibilize it so this binary exists and is very strong i don't want to take up like a lot of space i have a lot to say about this but i think that's yeah. my quick response to that Dina? you know yeah, okay, I want to talk about the Chittagong Ch Ch Hill tracks very definitely. Before that, Kaiser, yes, is there hope? I do think there is hope. I think um, there's hope when, gar you know, garment workers go out on the streets to struggle. I think there's hope when people keep going every day despite all of that. Um, it's This is a very wimpy answer, but I certainly, I mean, I think we're here because we're hopeful. We're not here. I know I sound very um, critical, but the criticism is meant to produce pathways, even if they are, for me, discursive narrative pathways. So I am actually very hopeful. And just very quickly, in terms of one of the things Bangladesh has done in terms of education for young girls, in terms of all of these good social indicator stuff, I think Bangladesh is a really wonderful example of how the state, I mean, this has been about the state allocating things. This is not about the market. If the market has been led to its, it had been left to itself, these things wouldn't have happened. This is about what they call the will, governmental will. And I think it's a good thing. Those are not things that I would reject. Those are things that other South Asian nations can learn from. Of course, you know, some of you are sitting in Colombo. Colombo had a socialist state to begin with, so they already have those numbers. But we can really learn from Bangladesh. The rest of uh, South Asia can do that. In terms of the Chittagong Hill Tracks, it seems to me that so much of the debate on national identity has been about secularism and being Bengali. It's a very self-absorbing narrative and it constructs Bangladesh as only Muslim or Bengali. And, you know, we are not all Bengali, this iconic poster that there is Amra Shabai Bangali, the poster for um, uh, Akaturi that, you know, we are all Banglar Bodho, Banglar Christian, Banglar Hindu, um, Banglar Muslim, Amra Shabai Bangali. Well, that leaves out other people that happen to be in this territory that became Bangladesh. So there's a real exclusionary aspect in the very uh, debates on secularism and nationalism that marginalized Chittagong Hill tracks. And I know certainly in anthropology, which is the one discipline I know, there's sort of a division between when you talk about Bangladeshi anthropology, you're doing certain kinds of culture. And then there is an other, an exoticization of a different kind that also has an imperial history to it. You know, where you talk about the Chittagong Hill tracks, there's that, and of course, there is all of the stuff on military exploitation, but the reason we don't even begin to talk about the Chittagong Hill tracks is because our debates just keep writing them out. And I think we do have to keep remembering that we are not all just Bengali. And in fact, the 11th Amendment or 14th Amendment, whatever it was, that reinstated secularism also reinstated the idea that Amadir national identity is Bengali again. So secularism does not even um, ensure any justice for people who are not Bengali. So we have to we have to look beyond the rhetoric, if you will. 
Bengalis, Biharis, a whole yes, kind of there constant. are so many multiple. There are multiple yeah. others. Uh, there's another I'm question. Bangali na, amra shabai bishamokami na. Ha, absolutely. Uh, a question for Rosina. Um, I'm not sure who who has asked this question, but uh, it's about what is the scope for investigative reporting in Bangladesh? What kind of institutional support is there for stories that are investigative and take long time to develop? And there's the potential. Is there the potential for regional or international collaboration, as was seen with Pandora Papers? One of the things I'd like to bring in before you come in, Rosina, is investigative journal. All journalism should be investigated, but investigative journalism, by its nature, is expensive. Uh, it often talks against power structures, so it's not simply the journalism. It's also a question of whether it will be published, whether there's safety for the journalists while they're doing so, whether there's legal support for the journalists while they're doing so, and whether anyone's interested in funding something over long term, which will go in depth which might go against the interest of their own corporate ownership. Um, so that's a loaded, a whole lot of questions, but Rosina, you're the one. Uh, actually, it is easy to blame in media and journalists, uh, but I, mm. I understand Russell, Jara and Dina, they, were talk, they are talking from like outside in Bangladesh and me and Shoy mm. Dilbhai yeah. is Bangladesh. My family is here. Not that's easy to say anything from yeah. uh, sitting here. But I, if I, if I, if I uh, share you a story, like I'm working with Prothomalo, it's a Bangladesh uh, um, high, uh, high uh, circulated newspaper. In 2016, uh, government stopped all advertisement. Uh, they called the uh, like telecommunication agency, all bank, all everywhere. Nobody came uh, to help us. Nobody, nobody came to uh, tell us, okay, you work, we are with you, but we survive because our journalism and you know, the government office, like our military office and uh, um, prime minister office, the stop to go there, uh, go, uh, we can't go there. And uh, in uh, government office, they never keep a uh, uh, newspaper. Um, they, uh, they used to read another newspaper because they, they got it free. We didn't say, uh, we didn't give anyone, we don't give anyone to uh, give it to free. And, uh, now come uh, about uh, investigative journalism in Bangladesh. Uh, they, uh, if, if you say it like like uh, America or any other countries, journalism it's it's not happening here because we need time. It's the time uh, to make an, an investigative journalism. But what Shohidul Bhai said, all reports should be investigative. Ma, why people call me investigative journalist? Because whatever I, I have written, I investigated. And uh, it, it took time, one month, two months. But in your sense, it's not like six months, one year projects. Because you know the situation of Bangladesh. And now uh, so many business people open newspaper. So you see the situation is not good. It, it's a worse. And if government come and stop our newspaper, some newspaper company will be happy because they, th they thought they are a Prothomalo is competitor or competitor. So they will be happy and nobody will uh, come with us and give, give us the job. I also, we do self-censorship some, sometimes because we have to survive fast. Absolutely. A dead newspaper doesn't help anyone. Uh, but uh, while we're talking, there's another area which I think is very significant, very important. I mean, over the years, our, you know, our, our institutions have been demolished. All the major institutions, which should be state institutions, have become essentially government, part of the government machinery, mm -hmm. and aiding and abetting the sustenance, the sustenance of this particular regime. Uh, so that is a problem. But I think some of those can be fixed uh, if there is a change in some way. And I'm not simply talking of a change of regime because that in itself will not solve anything if we have a systemic. Uh, problem as we do. So there has to be a systemic shift. Uh, simply changing people at the top, I don't think is sufficient. But for me, what has caused the maximum damage is the damage to the education sector. The country has right. gone back decades because of the there is total no professional editor. Sorry? There is no professional, there is no professional editor. 
that's the big problem. I mean, the, the fact that meritocracy no longer matters in the academia, uh, academic system is bizarre. If you look at the level of the people who populate our universities, uh, particularly the private, public universities, it's, it's appalling. So we have created a situation where your intellectual ability, your merit, your skills do not matter. The only thing that matters is party loyalty. That applies to teachers, that applies to administrators, that applies to students. And that is a really serious damage that is being done to this country, which we will take ages. We, the nation has gone decades back because of what that's happened. It's not merely about Abrar being, of course, that was horrendous, but there are torture cells in every university. Every public yeah. university has a torture cell. How incredible is that? Is there anyone who would like to talk on that or the other area we've not really discussed too much, environment? Right. Um, While you're thinking, I, let me pick up on what Rosina mentioned. He, she uh, very skillfully did not mention the names of the business groups. Uh, you know, <laughs> the reality is you and I are here. I was actually sitting on this very chair on the night of 5th of August, 2018, when I was picked up. So uh, this is part of our reality. And every time I come up and say something like this, I get tons of messages to say, watch out what's happening tonight. And I, I have had to go underground on times because I've continued to say things I've said. But for me, really, it is a problem that people in Bangladesh uh, are not speaking out, that we wish, whisper constantly. And one of the concerns is not merely that we're speaking out. We have actually forgotten to exercise our minds. And that has a deeper connotation than we can possibly imagine. But let me come back to you. Education is one, environment is another. Both with ease. Anyone? Mm. Well, yeah. Uh, hmm. I'm not in Bangladesh, but um, I suppose in relation to what you were just saying about not speaking out, I suppose if you were, you know, a garment worker demanding wages can be picked up on or has been, have been picked up on these stupid, um, whatever, di digital security. So it's really quite extraordinary that does not stop them from going on going out there because it really is such a life and death situation but sometimes yeah I can see why people would stop because there's so much at stake and you don't have protection I want to talk about the environment and one of the things I see and I saw another question I think on ethnic minorities that are not in the hills I don't know what to call them the Shautals and Kasias and others, one of the things I see happening is that in the name of development, these people are actually being moved off their, displaced from their land. So Bangladesh has a plan for 100 export processing zones. Where are they going to put those zones? It's not as though there's a lot of free space. So for development, for growth, they're... Um, basically displacing indigenous minorities as has happened everywhere in the world. There, in fact, what's happening in Bangladesh is so similar to what's happened in India, what's happened in other places. And I think the questioner was, was saying, it doesn't matter, what does it matter if a more communal government comes in? I, I think it's a question of the kind of capitalist development that you're imagining and the cost that, of that, and it's, you know, in this idea of development as growth, it's okay to displace 200,000 people to, for, to, in order to have, maintain this, you know, 8% growth rate. That's where, and the minorities, those with the least voice will be the first to go. And I think that's where I see the minority question. And that's related to the ecology question because, these things are very ecologically, I don't want to romanticize minor, you know, anybody, but clearly the way land is used in industry versus the way land is used if you're doing it for, you know, something else. There's a lot of ecological cost that we've seen in the Shundarbons, we're seeing with development. 
And part of it is this very, this talking about not questioning, I think people simply do not question what development means. Most people, development means, is development is all, of, nation building is all about a kind of, uh, about development at whatever cost. And the environmental costs are just not being seen. And this is partly why the government can make all of these deals. There really isn't as much resistance to what's happening in the Shundarbans or anywhere else that there should be, because there isn't an understanding, and perhaps it also goes back to education and sort of development. Right? There is a more sinister aspect. When I've spoken to people about the Rupu plant, people uh -huh. very, very high up have said it's her pet project. That's one thing yeah. that simply cannot be questioned. And one of the things that questions that have to be raised is uh, waste disposal of a nuclear plant, uh, which is a huge cost, both ecologically and economically. Yeah. Yet it is not being discussed. It's not being talked about. But, uh, you know, we're coming towards the end of this. It's been fascinating. It's been lively and you've all engaged beautifully. Thank you for that. But I can't stop this without bringing up the two big elephants in the room. India yeah. and China. Yeah. Some of someone here has to talk about the China India equation and where Bangladesh fits in within that. Is anyone going to have a go? <laughs> no, I, I had a couple of things I wanted to say in response to Dina, but uh, they're not about China. Go on, go on. Yeah. It'll give yeah. it breathing time to others to think of my question. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess just to kind of link what Dina was saying back to um, archives and knowledge, I think one one important part of the, the murder or the displa displacement and murder in many ways of indigenous populations is about the loss of indigenous knowledge about how we live together with the land and with the ecology and with the environment. Um, and I think a lot of it goes back to what, what our priorities are as a society. And I, I think as Dina said, it's, it's what we're in right now is a capitalist regime that prioritizes economic growth above all else and that is as we've seen across the world we're in a climate crisis it's not the way it's not the sustainable way forward for the for anyone um i think the other thing that we i mean we've talked briefly about uh the possibilities of international solidarity but we've not really addressed how um the bangladeshi population is going to be one of the countries and one of the populations most hit by the climate crisis as a result of the actions of other people in other countries, mm -hmm. primarily in the global north. And I think it's important when we talk about international mm -hmm. solidarity that we acknowledge that huge, huge, huge power disparity and how people are being affected, displaced, how their land, how their lives and livelihoods are being submerged as we speak. Um, and unless something happens, not that's out of the control of everyone in, in the country, uh, that's just going to keep continuing. It is interesting to see how minimal the debate is on climate change in Bangladesh. I mean, it's there, but um, there's a, yeah, okay, true. I, but I think because more immediate things come in and climate change is tied in with everyday living, you know, Chorbhanga mm -hmm. is something that is part of our culture. So it's very hard to distinguish some of that. Maybe that's part of it. You know, I was thinking about China and the Belt and Road Initiative, and I think Bangladesh was invited and refused for whatever reason. Like, countries like Bangladesh are in such an odd situation. On the one hand, you have the neighbor. I think of India as the hegemonic neighbor in the same way, you know, the, the United the relationship between Mexico and the United States is the relationship between India and Bangladesh. Perhaps the India-Bangladesh relationship is more toxic, I would say. You know, it's there's a lot more hegemony being exercised. Um, but I think a place like Bangladesh just has so much um, is so caught. On the one hand, you want to not be uh, Bangladesh has nothing except I don't know. I mean, it doesn't have natural resources. People want it because it's a midway place. So um, I don't see the Chinese in Bangladesh in the same way they seem to be in Sri Lanka or in Africa. but um, I don't see the Bangladeshi government negotiating very skillfully necessarily playing one off the other. I'm not at all a political scientist, but it seems to me that one could. I don't know. 
one could play one's cards more carefully. But they are, um, they, they, you know, here is again one um, way in which the national is never just the national. There are these shadow international players that we must always, so we are, when we're talking about Rupur or whenever the power plants, it may be somebody's pet project, but there's also a lot of pressure to keep those projects going when the money, you know, investment is coming from China or India, right? And we just have to keep remembering that. Uh, Not a great answer to your question, but, you know. No, no, no. I mean, this, this is a discussion, and I'm very happy by the, with the way things have been going in this. Usually, I was talking to Subhanga earlier on, generally when you're moderating, you have to rein people in because people babble on, have no oh. awareness of how, how time goes and hog, other, hog the space and things like that. Here it's been completely the other way around, very pleasurable to me. Uh, one little question which Subhanga has brought up, it's uh, Bangladesh being left out of the Democracy Summit taking place right now. Any comments on that? Hmm. Uh, I don't understand why we have like so much coverage on that to begin with. <laughs> I mean, okay. um, oh, carry on. Um, yeah. I think like this relationship. Like, you know, invited. So many journalists invited from so many countries. <laughs> they came um, to our office yesterday. Uh, I meet them. They are very happy with this. You were invited by whom? Sorry. Bangladesh, Bangladesh. A lot of journalists were invited from Bangladesh to the summit. Yeah, in the peace summit. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know. I think <clears throat> this uh, US fascination or like that they, they are, if they don't acknowledge our democracy, then we don't right, have democracy. Right. So that becomes like a really, yeah, yeah. Um, a, <laughs> that becomes the problem itself, right? Um, mm. That's happening. I mean, I can like contextualize it in like queer movement that, there is a lot of involvement of the U.S. Embassy in our movement, and I would be very unpopular saying it because they already hate me, and they're gonna just you know, tell, you know leave USA. Like why are you there? Um, I think like there is a lot of um, you know like prescription like in this kind of summit seminars. Like uh, validation is there, but also like how to sustain democracy. They like they there are like so many in. Um, uh, international NGOs now now in in Bangladesh and it's growing like IRI, uh, International uh, Republican Institute and um, uh, uh, NED National Endowment of Democracy. They're coming to Bangladesh and teaching us how to govern. You know, teaching, tell us how. Yeah. To, yeah, they're they're preaching and teaching and because they know it all, right? Like they know it right. They know how to do it. So I think this kind of summit and when we are not invited and when that becomes the headline of the newspaper, I often like, I mean, it, it's almost like, um, it's, it's so amusing to me to, to right. see that our fascination to be validated by, by them it is happening in the queer movement as well, like the US embassy. And when we get invited by them <laughs> to, their, to, to their houses and we get to, um, talk about like how we are getting discriminated and they sort of you know advise us how to uh, 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 proceed with our how to achieve our rights um, right. and that is that is coming uh, that is happening i think across the civil society in bangladesh and very, very well said, such a great point oh sorry yeah no, no, no. Uh, I, i'd actually put my video off for a minute because i sneaked out i was trying to get my free Julian Assange t-shirt. Uh. I'm not wearing it. But we did actually have a huge Ju free Julian Assad banner on our building for a long wow. time. And, you know, here we are, countries like the US, Australia, uh, the UK preaching democracy to us, where dissidents in their own country, when it comes close to home, suddenly it becomes a different set of rules. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. come across too many countries that don't... Uh, you know, espouse democracy and freedom in their rhetoric and actively suppress it in their practice. So that's Absolutely. the way, just the way it works. But I, I think we will need to wrap this up at some point. I would like to give each of you uh, a one-liner or a two-liner or something like that. I would like to look forward in the sense we have critiqued our nation, but we are Bangladeshis. We, this is a nation we love. And that's one of the sad things. When we critique our country, we become 
victims of sedition, we are people who, who hate Bangladesh, we are people who are anti-liberation, we are Jamaatis. Uh, the, unless you're a, someone close to the ruling party, and it doesn't matter which ruling party it is, see, this has happened with every ruling party, unless you're close to the ruling party, you're anti-Bangladesh, anti yeah, that's, that's how it's been presented. But we are the people who do love this country, who done, and many of us have sacrificed a lot, taken a lot of risks, walked down a very difficult line in order to continue to say what we do. But let's, on that note, look forward to Bangladesh. And I would like to ask each one of you, what sort of a Bangladesh do you dream of? And how do you see us getting there? A short statement from each one. Oh. Who needs to start? <laughs> Zara, you're the first person generally. <laughs> <laughs> Always. I feel like I got a, a rough deal joining the call early. Um, I think for me, it's we've talked so much about power and how power moves in all these insidious ways and about history. So I think for me, the Bangladesh of the future that I would like to see would be one that confronts its colonial power dynamics and its colonial history and moves forward in, in creating a, a new future that doesn't have those same dynamics uh, in, in how power is manifested and moves in the society. Because I think that can affect a lot of the things we've been talking about from environment to policy to mm. solidarity. Thank you. Russell. What kind of Bangladesh? Um, I think like, you know, it begins with us. Uh, we need to be a little bit more self-critical, right? Even the space that we are creating, like who are not here, you know, we are talking about all the big issues in, in Bangladesh. But every time I'm not talking about Himal or like any, any, any special specific kind of um, uh, panel discussion, but um, the marginalized community members, uh, people like, like me or like Rosina or like many of us, we are called upon as um, trauma samples, right? Like we, we come and we share our trauma and then like we talk about like the big developments and everything that is going on, the scholarly bit. So I think like that, that culture also needs to change and we need to be a little bit more self-critical that how can we look into the landscape of GDP through the lens of um, queerness, you know, and, and indigenous uh, uh, oppression, which is, which is happening in Bangladesh. So, um, just to open up the space a little bit more and thinking about like who are left out, like even in our, like our space of critique, the space that we are creating. Lina. Some of, there's some overlap. I think uh, Bangladeshis in general need to be less defensive culturally. And I'm going off what Russell said about the summit. Um, and what Zara was saying too, perhaps, you know, really do some reflection to get out of a colonial, uh, these colonial power relations that are, we're constantly seem to be reproducing by seeking validation. I mean, I'm going to be also very unpopular here. I mean, do we really need to hear from Omar Toshin to tell us that we have arrived at some, you know, development? We just don't, I mean, how about not doing that? And thinking instead about having what, what I think of in the future is, you know, having real conversations with every, you know, with people about what development means and people have different ideas, right? I don't know. So not specifically through one lens or another, but, but what is the future? You know, I think we have a very ossified but very dominant idea of where the nation is headed, should be headed. It's just we're, we've lost our path because of autocracy or militarization. I, I, I think we have to go back to our original ideas of what the kinds of redistribution and equality we can have, what equality might even mean. And it will mean different things, but it will mean actually minimally the right to education, the right to have a roof over my one's head and the right to refuse to go into uh, a building that's about to fall down. I mean, there are many things in there, but it goes back to decolonizing our minds, but also refusing neoliberal capitalist ideas of what is good for Bangladesh. Rosina, you're the only panelist who's sitting in Bangladesh, but uh. <laughs> this opportunity to 
at least dream about a Bangladesh yeah, that you yeah. might want to grow up in. Actually, whatever we have uh, said all this, because we love Bangladesh, uh, we want Bangladesh to win. In my my editor always said, "Amra Bangladesh joy chai." Whatever we say, it's our country. So uh, for for my side, I want freedom of writing. I want freedom of space. If I can talk, it, uh, I I will get so many things actually. Thank you. Okay. Well, on that note, I uh, I would like to thank Himal South Asia for organizing this. What a dream panel to have, really. Uh, so uh, my job has been entirely pleasurable uh, in doing this. Subanga, how do we do it? Should I pass it on to you? Uh, thank, to you for yeah, thank, so you, thank, thank you for moderating so beautifully. Thank you. You're we muted. You're muted, Subanga. Uh, sorry, no, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Uh, no, I was saying, Shaidul, you got a sense from those thanks, how it went. Um, it was the pleasure was all ours. I mean, this was very enjoyable and quite, I think, uh, you know, a learning opportunity. And I can think of so many lines of arguments and thoughts and debates that I think we should pursue going ahead in different forms as stories, as articles, you know, as maybe future panels. So um, thank you so much, everyone, again, for, you know, contributing and, and coming and making this uh, event happen. Um, and uh, thank you, Shahidul, for expertly, uh, you know, taking this forward. Um, before ending, I will just remind everyone that we're also doing a launch. So a special issue is now uh, available on our website. If you go to himalmag.com, you can read some of the articles that have been published today. Um, over the next few weeks, more articles will be published online. So please, please go and read those pieces. And uh, you can also go to the membership portal on our website, uh, himalmag.com slash membership. And you can support our journalism and you know make all of this possible. Um, so thank you again, everyone. And uh, I think uh, I think we can wrap up now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.